Welcome to Adapter's Advantage, breakthrough moments that lead to success. Our podcast brings you insider stories of the moments that matter, turning points on the sometimes rocky road to success. Here's your host, Mark Magnaca, president and co-founder of Alego, the workforce training and readiness platform built for distributed teams. Hi, I'm Mark Magnaca. I want to welcome you to our next episode of Adapter's Advantage. I'm here with David Bodders of Sparks IQ. Before we get started, I want to give you a brief background on David. He founded Strategic Pricing Associates, SPA, in 1993 to generate profitable growth for clients through analytics. In 2015, he founded Spa Sigma to fill a skills gap in sales teams' ability to navigate evolving buyer practices in today's digital economy. In 2019, David merged both companies to create Sparks IQ, which provides analytics, tools, and training solutions to accelerate sales, performance, and profitability. I can tell you that David is somebody that I know who has, he was an early adopter of this, and the world has come to this point of view, which is using the power of analytics to help make better better decisions. So David, with that, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Glad to be here this morning. So David, let's jump right in with uh, the question I like to start with. Given the evolution of Sparks IQ that I just described, when people meet you and they say, what is Sparks IQ and what do you do? What do you say? Well, it's a little bit tricky because we have a a pretty broad-based business, but in simple terms, I'm the founder and CEO of Sparks IQ. So what is Sparks IQ? Sparks IQ is a company that provides the AI-based sales, pricing, and profitability analytics on the analytical side, and the Hollywood-based sales training solutions on the selling skills side, both of which accelerate sales and profitability across a broad diversity of vertical markets. So technology products, financial services, professional services, industrial B2B, which means broadly manufacturing and distribution. So my work center is really on the creative process, which is understanding what are the complex analytical and skills needs of our customers. And then basically it's my job to work relentlessly to identify and build the solutions that would improve their performance. So the big questions I work on broadly on a daily basis fall under the rubric of um, in sales, conversations matter. So the big question in all of the verticals that we serve is, on any given day, who should talk to whom about what? And Sparks IQ leverages data to understand the best opportunities to sell more and to sell more profitably. What got you interested in pricing? And how did you realize that there was a market opportunity to help people price better? Well, the the funny thing is that really, if you think about it at a very basic level, every revenue dollar that a company generates is the result of a pricing decision. So how effectively companies make those decisions, how effectively they convert customer value into shareholder value is fundamental to the success of modern business. What we found as we looked out at the marketplace is that sellers had two problems. One is they they didn't have the strategic insights needed to understand how to differentiate pricing. And then secondly, they didn't have the disciplines in their sales teams to uh, capture the pricing that was strategic. So you had a setting gap, which was knowing what the price should be. And you had a getting gap, which is sellers caving in on price, haggling with their customers and failing to capture the value. So the foundational um, element of capturing value from the value created from the customer was broken. And that, that issue was endemic across a broad variety of industries. So we realized that if we could solve that problem, we could unlock a lot more value from the relationships that companies have. So so let me uh, just connect that to our listeners on this podcast. My suspicion is that almost everyone who's either been in sales or who's been in sales management, or frankly, anyone who's bought anything has experienced this dynamic where a price is given to you. The the price is is, uh, very often absent context, right? And then, there's a, a haggling that happens, like this negotiation process. But in, mo- in most cases, the people are negotiating, they don't even have a framework 
in which they are negotiating, they're just, they just know if the price was X to start with, they want to pay X minus something else if they're the buyer. Yes. Uh, is, is that accurate? Yeah, it's, it's, really, um, it's really true. One of the things we teach in our negotiation training program is what we call the golden question. And this is foundational for sellers. And the qu golden question is, if there are pressures on me to sell, what are the pressures on the other party to buy? And the reason that people engage in these conversations is both parties have pressures, but as sellers, when we fail to understand the pressures on the other side, we have lopsided negotiations. We don't ground our, our price discussions in value and we end up haggling, which is the opposite of negotiation. So uh, what happens- Or begging, or begging, right? Or begging and, and then right. we end up teaching our customers to beg because we show them that it works. Yep. And then we have the additional problem, which is that most uh, professional buyers are trained in negotiation skills, whereas most sellers are not. And so you have a kind of an unlevel playing field that predictably helps people to sell smaller deals at worse terms of trade. So their companies grow more slowly and are less profitable because they don't have an answer to that imbalance between buyers and sellers. So what you just described, David, is my, my words now, an asymmetric relationship that exists in many cases between a regular salesperson and a quote procurement person. A procurement person's job is literally live, breathe, and eat almost 24 hours a day, how to get the best price, including negotiation skills. And for a salesperson, they have to do all of these other discrete activities from prospecting to discovery, to presentation. And then, oh, by the way, they get to negotiation, which is like one sliver of the pie for them. So you come into this dynamic and there's, there's an imbalance in the relationship. And you're saying part of your work is to help sellers, A, understand that, and B, train them to be able to compete in a symmetrical versus asymmetrical relationship. That's right. And part of it is you can think of the analogy in football. So the job of a seller is to get into the red zone. And the big question that negotiation raises is, are you going to get a field goal or a touchdown? Yeah. You went all the way down the field. You're close to the end. But depending on how you handle that negotiation, you may end up with three points or seven. And as that, that process repeats itself day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, people earn less money and they leave money on the table with their customers. One of the key points is that the, the true job of a professional buyer is to buy the preferred solution at a lower price. It is not to change suppliers. Right, so that's, a, that's a great insight. Yeah, anytime a, a professional buyer forces their company's users into an inferior solution, they lose leverage in their buying process. Yep. And so ultimately what you have to understand in a professional buying situation is that you have all the leverage in the world because the buyer actually can't switch suppliers. And so it's fundamentally a haggling exercise most of the time. So you can imagine if a Lego is going up against another company and everybody loves the, the immersive social learning experience that a Lego provides and they're pointing you against some Soviet style LMS <laughs> and, the, and the buyer is telling you, you're going to have to do things like they did in, in the old Soviet Union command and control. They don't really have negotiating leverage, um, but they that doesn't stop them from presenting their, themselves as having. And so that's, that's really the key insight. There are always pressures on the other side. But I've seen over and over again, the, the default mechanism to kick for the field goal instead of going for the touchdown. <laughs> and, and given that this is being recorded just after the Super Bowl um, with Tom Brady and his uh, unbelievable performance, what I think it demonstrates is he goes for the touchdown. He That's right. Patrick he Mahomes, effectively, whatever else you can say about the game and the officiating, what you can say definitively is that Kansas City got zero touchdowns. All they got was field goals. That's right. And you can't for an, elite, for an elite quarterback, that's preposterous. And so you have to ask, what is it that in the sales world that leads to touchdowns rather than field goals? And too often people think as long as we put points up on the board, that is sales. That we're doing well. When you're in, when you're down on the one yard line, and you you get three points, you didn't succeed. And yeah, that's a that's a tough lesson for sellers to get to. That's a, it's a, no. I think what you just said that 
completely resonates, I think, with anybody who watched the Super Bowl, which is a lot of our listeners here, is that recognition that just because if you remember the first three points up on the board were from Kansas City, right? So the the notion that just getting points on the board, which is kind of like saying we just want to get new logos, which is a big thing in the software business, right? Not recognizing, wait a minute, once you're done burning through venture capital money that you know you, you may be spending differently than you would be if it was coming from your savings account, then you realize that just getting points on the board is not enough. And, and to your point, David, what I took away from it is the notion of refining your ideal client profile, getting so clear that you know that what you're doing is like the key fitting in a lock and that you're dealing with someone for whom what you do is the preferred solution. And of course, you can have a negotiation around commercial terms to come to an interest that, that, it, that serves a mutual interest. But ver that versus the idea that you're in an asymmetrical relationship with a procurement person who's going to bang you over the head and, and you have nothing you can do. Yeah, we have a, a funny, you know, not to go too far in the sports analogy, but what's happened with analytics in football and in basketball in a related way is that they're understanding it's so important to be able to get those extra points that more and more teams are now going for it on fourth down. They're not kicking field goals. They're not punting as often as they used to because they understand how important those extra points are. Same thing in basketball where they understood the disproportionate value of the three-pointer versus the, uh, the two-pointer. So analytics now are teaching people really important insights and in how important that last uh, answer is which is how many, what outcome did you get for all that work? And that's, uh, that's a big idea. So David, can you ex uh, describe a personal pivot point or a moment of learning that changed your approach in your role as CEO of, of Sparks IQ? Sure, and there's been a lot of pivot points over the course of, of my career, and I suspect for most people listening today. Um, I think for me, the, the big idea has been that the more time I spend with real customers, and particularly the most demanding, sometimes difficult customers, the more we learn. And the more we learn, the more we can innovate. And at the end of the day, innovation is about, can you solve valuable problems for customers in the real world that they live in? And if you don't spend enough time with customers, then you're, you're left speculating about things that you really need to discover. And in the world that we live in, innovation is, is critical to our success as a company. It's innovation that helps us to makes it better to be our customer and harder to be our competitor. So it all goes back to the key insight, which is you can't really innovate unless you spend tons of time with tough demanding customers. And that to me has been a revelation. I, lo I love it, David. I learned the same lesson. It's so interesting. I learned it in a different format from um, a guy by the name of Dan Sullivan, who runs a program called The Strategic Coach. And one of the things that I learned early on, and, and it, it actually related to Alego, was he said, only ask, solicit opinions from people who can write you a check. Everyone's got an opinion, but not everybody can write you a check. And so when I took this idea to my very first customer, I knew they had the ability to write a check. And the few people who were not check writers, who uh, all of whom, four or five of them said, there's no way, that's not going to work. It already exists. Don't waste your time, like all of that. But the, the syn synthesis of, wait a minute, just ask for check writers is kind of the same concept. I think that's very freeing. And it also yeah. helps you with those people who are the difficult customers you just described. Instead of being angry that they're difficult, you realize they're helping you build emotional fortitude and muscles that you didn't have. That's right. And that's, that's where so much of this world of business is like the world of sports. Until you've been through the adversity, until you've had to adapt, uh, had, until you've had to be agile, um, you really haven't, uh, you're not hitting your stride in the, as a business. And it's uh, that adaptation that flexibility, that resilience that defines the most successful business. And I think one of the more interesting corollaries to that is that your willingness and ability to take calculated risks and even to fail is critical to innovation because companies that aren't willing to take risks never test the ideas that often unlock the big breakthroughs that, uh, that transform the world. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the backside of that idea, if you will. Well, we're, we're very much in sync on that. It's a fundamental operating principle at Alego and in this search for the truth and a willingness to accept your mistakes 
And we really work hard to embed that. I find at many companies, David, it's, it's, like this, um, it's like this statement. Everybody knows that money doesn't buy happiness, mm-hmm. but everybody wants to find out for themselves. <laughs> and, right. and, you know, in the same way, everyone knows that ideas come, great things come from mistakes, but nobody really wants to be the one making them. And so we're really working hard to embed what you just described culturally, um, because it's, it's absolutely true that if I look back, you know, in, in the story arc, not just of our business, but of so many that I've studied, it's this mistake after mistake after mistake, whether it was Thomas Edison or Steve Jobs failing at this thing before they had a breakthrough. And, and then you look at, you look at companies like Detroit in the eighties and you realize they were on top of the world. They owned everything and there was no innovation coming out of it because they were only competing with each other. That's right. It was complacency. And, you know, frankly, I think the other aspect to that, a related aspect is you're only, you only grow as much as the people you interact with every day. So having diversity of talent, of perspectives, working with partners who, who help, help you to elevate your understanding of the world, to challenge you to, to be the best version of yourself, that's another dimension of, of how you really um, maximize your potential. And so I think even thinking about who's in your company and what do they bring to the table? Who are your partners and how are you learning from them? What are they learning from you? I think it's it's really about that continuous learning mindset. Well, that's a great segue because my my next question for you was, how are you helping your clients adapt in this new environment, particularly as it relates to them being virtual? Yeah, well, I mean, everybody had to change all at once with uh, COVID-19. And so a lot of the trends that have been building over the years all of a sudden got it unleashed en masse uh, to the general population. We all switched from working in offices a lot of the time to a uh, virtual workplace, work from home. What happened in that situation, there was a lot of positive things that came out of it. People were more productive. They had more time for their families if they had the discipline to, to cut the cord at the end of the day. Um, but there, were also, there was also a lot of fallout from it, which was that people were spending time on camera, they're getting fatigued by it. The endless Zoom meetings, I sometimes call it a Ferris wheel where one person gets off the ride and another person gets on the ride. You know, historically when people did training, they either did instructor-led training, which tended to be live, or they did green screen video where somebody's talking at a camera and basically pushing information at them. What's happened with with COVID and and this new work from home paradigm, which is unlikely to go away anytime uh, in the future, is fundamentally people are exhausted from being on Zoom meetings. And the last thing they want when they get on, uh, when when it comes to learning is to show up for an eight hour Zoom meeting with a virtual instructor. And so what we've done is we've brought new forms of uh, skills training based on the ways that Hollywood provides our favorite TV shows and movies and streaming, we brought that rich and immersive experience that's on demand. And now when you go to get your training, it doesn't have to feel boring anymore. It can be you know, short segment video, just like the, the new episodes uh, on Netflix and other services are showing. People prefer shorter form. They want immersive video where it feels like they're, they're really engaged and energized by it. So what we do at Sparks IQ as we find what are the most valuable skills for a seller to know? How do we build the uh, instructional design platform for those uh, training programs? And then most importantly, how do we not stop there, but actually push it through the whole uh, Hollywood production process? So what comes out on the other side is something that has the rigor of instructional design, but also has the uh, engagement and entertainment value of your favorite TV shows. And I think in a world where people are working longer hours, spending too much time on Zoom, we have a really nice uh, consumption format that helps people build the skills that matter, but to do it in a way that acknowledges the realities of the tough day-to-day environment that modern sellers are in. This form factor of having a Hollywood level production, but, but not something that feels fake, rather something that feels that the, the people on screen are speaking like actual salespeople would speak, that makes a huge difference in the ability to want to engage with it. Yeah, we think authenticity is so important. It has to be socially relevant. It has to reflect the world that sellers are really in. So we pay a lot of attention to who are the characters in our shows? 
who are, do they really represent the, the, the modern workforce that we see today? Do they address the social aspects which so many of us are thinking and talking about? We're not trying to create controversial content, but we do want it to be socially relevant. And we want people to feel like it is aspirational for those who, uh, who watch it. But uh, at the end of the day, we say it's binge-worthy content. A lot of people claim that their content is binge-worthy. We say that the economic definition of binge-worthiness is whether sellers naturally consume the training faster than they were asked to. And that's what happens with each of us on Netflix or any other streaming service. That's the reason they keep burning through billions of dollars programming content because we keep consuming things faster than they want us to. And yeah. it's so absolutely that, right. It's, it's right. It's right on the money. And I, I think that what, what you can say um, with a high level of certainty is the traditional LMS compulsory content is not stuff that people wanted to binge watch. We have data that suggests from clients of ours in the pharmaceutical and med device business that 99% of content in their LMS system, one company in particular that was at one of our recent conferences, 99% of it is never watched again. So <laughs> once you've been through the compulsory, I had to do it. And by the way, they weren't necessarily even watching it. It was playing on their screen, right? That's right. And you know, one thing that we always say is that the tough question for the talent development uh, departments in a lot of these companies is what percent of their content is binge-worthy versus cringe-worthy? Yes, and that's the heart of the adoption problem. When you have a, a ratio that's high in cringeworthy content, like green screen video, voiceover, PowerPoint, uh, recorded webinars, things like that, that's cringeworthy, um, you're going to find adoption problems. And what happens when sellers don't learn is they don't serve their buyers and everybody suffers. So it's a, a big idea. It seems like binge worthy would be a nice to have. It's actually foundational to the idea of daily lifelong work. And uh, that's why we've invested so heavily in that. And so, so when you think about people who have an instructional design background, people have a training background, people have an L&D background, I find that it's a huge relief when they realize, well, wait a minute, you didn't carry the bag doing this job for 20 years. You can't possibly have the credibility that your number one salesperson has. But if you're the one that can get your number one salespeople person to share a story, you win anyway. Because the goal is for people to watch it, consume it, learn from it, and act upon it. You can make that happen as a director rather than you being the green screen actor doing voiceover. That's a big idea. And it comes down to the, the power of crowdsourcing of content and peer-to-peer -peer learning. And that is that so much of the value in skills training is how and whether sellers learn to adapt that to the particular customers and markets that they serve. And given the diversity of markets that sellers are in today, there is no one uh, application or one way of doing it. So the, the ability to foster this peer-to-peer -peer learning and adaptation in the real marketplace, learning what works in different uh, customer segments or different uh, vertical markets, being able to share that at scale is so critical because it's really about the adaptation as much as it is about the skills mastery. What do you recommend as someone who spent a lot of time thinking about this, who does produce Hollywood level stuff? What do people need to know to avoid being cringeworthy and recognizing that a video like Simon Sinek that was recorded on, on like an eight millimeter camera um, has become one of the top TED talks of all time. And it's not even a good recording. Well, I think you put your finger on something important. By the way, I don't think companies need to choose between uh, the YouTube model and the Netflix model. I think that's why we're partnered with Lego is that you can do both. Uh, you can have the football game played professionally on Sunday and you can have the crowd talking about it for a week after that. That's good. That's I mean, good. I like that. And uh, you can imagine if you showed somebody the uh, an IRS uh, forms video and you ask them to share videos about it, it would be rather dull and uninteresting. So what's in the box does influence what the conversations are about and whether they're quality, there's the whole adage of the blind leading the blind. So at some point you can have very bad sales practices that also spread. So um, I think it is important to embrace both ideas, but for companies that don't have the resources for Hollywood style, either A, find a company that can give you that sort of thing, which yep. helps you quickly get to it. And that's our role in the world. Um, but the other thing to remember is that there's lots of ways to keep people engaged. And sometimes it's binge worthy because it's a high production value like Hollywood. But other times, as you pointed out, whether it's social media or YouTube or things like that, the real 
uh, touch points are about authenticity and relevance. And so people don't need a binge worthy uh, video about how to install an HP printer. What they need is high relevance. Right. So don't need a, a binge worthy video about um, how to uh, support your colleagues serving Coca-Cola in a different city. What does Coca-Cola require in Pittsburgh that they might require in Atlanta as well? That's about you know, the authenticity and relevance. So people like video as we've learned from social media doesn't have to be binge worthy, but it has to either be high in authenticity or high in relevance. And those are both things that can be scaled economically and that in a proper content platform uh, augment the, uh, the more binge worthy, more structured learning that needs to be provided. So David, let me add one piece to what you just said here, just to complete that thought. And if you use the example of the YouTube video on how to change a flat tire, um, if, if you get a flat tire and you never changed a flat tire in your car and you pull over on the side of the road and you can pull up that video that's on your exact make and model and you can literally do that faster than, you know, say calling AAA, mm -hmm. um, that video has enormous value to you. And the fact that you may not watch it again doesn't mean the content's not good because other people who have that car may in fact watch it. So that's I think we, realizing there's almost like a two different swim streams of content. There's this content that you're looking for more of a broad uptake of, but then there's kind of that long tail content that could be hyper relevant for a group of your salespeople in one selling situation. And it's important to have in the library, even though it's not an everyday viewing kind of thing. That's right. We call that the, those are the just in time learnings that you need at the exact moment in time. It's just enough, just for me, and not just in case learning. And uh, that just in time idea is extremely powerful. And what you really need to do is invert the content creation engine. Historically, it was a small number of authority figures pushing content down to populations who may or may not have found value. And certainly it was not adaptive. And what's changed with the, the worldview that Alego and Sparks IQ embrace is that the, the single authority figure or department can never accomplish the insights that the crowd has at yeah. that scale. And that's really, if you want more of these insights just in time, you have to address the question, where will that come from? It can only come from that if every consumer is also potentially a producer. So let's just talk for a minute here. We've got time for just two more questions. Um, tell me about your experience, David, in using the power of video in terms of interactions with your existing clients and, and even in, from a prospecting standpoint, I know you've got experts on your team like Mike Kunkel, who are so well regarded in the sales enablement space. What are you finding in terms of how people are responding to this video? And what do people need to know that's changed about the use of video? Yeah, so, so the real power of video is the ability for, first of all, on-demand asynchronous engagement. So I can do it when I want to. And if I record video, then my manager can review it when they want to. We all know how overstretched we are in terms of time pressures and bandwidth limitations. The big issue is how do we, how do we create short form content that's easy to consume? How do we get people to, um, to really uh, lean into it, to consume it, to adapt to it, to do the role playing, the uh, coaching exercises that help people to do more of these activities. You know, there's a lot of great research that shows how powerful feedback and coaching is in the performance of sales teams. But what video enables you to do is again, to break that synchronicity problem where we have to be there at the same time. It also lowers the, the intimidation factor of having your boss watching you while you do it your first time, it allows you to practice anonymously and then upload the version that's the best version of what you do. So I think it, it's allowing people to um, take more risk, to practice more on their own, to have higher level uh, outcomes and, and really to um, align the modern skills development uh, domain with the realities of daily life and the old ways of showing up in, in conference rooms and traveling to hotels and using airlines and all of that. It just wasted so much time. It was not retentive. The forgetting curve is real. And at the end of the day, what video is enabling us to do is to, to really address each of these issues in learning and to unleash a new generation of, of the knowledge skill-based uh, professional. 
So last question for you, based on your experience, what do you think is the most important skill that people should learn or improve today? Well, I'm going to hedge on this, unfortunately. There's two important skills as I see it. One of them is business acumen. So too many salespeople are not understanding their customers and how they make money, how they succeed in business. They're so focused on their own solutions and what they do that they're not understanding, not just who the other party is, but how they make money. There's a lot of people who do discovery and ask questions. They, they try to uncover who is this person that I'm selling to, but they don't really understand the business of that person. And you can't really be a value-based seller until you understand the business of the person you're selling to. So I'd say business acumen consistently shows up as one of the, uh, the key uh, gaps in seller capabilities. And it's one that our company is focused on resolving now with a new course. Um, we also have to pay attention to the human to human skills, what I call H to H, because what's happening in part because of the sales enablement movement, in part because of just an engineering or systems approach to sales is that people are, are becoming a little bit robotic, frankly, in the way that they sell. And we've all been on calls where you can tell somebody's following a script. They're very much, uh, you know, following uh, a play, which is important. We do need a more of a systems approach to selling, but it's the human to human skills that create authenticity. And it's authenticity that allows people to connect in a more meaningful way. That's when more information gets exchanged. And so I think we have to balance the drive for, towards a more systems-based approach to selling with uh, also a greater emphasis on human to human skills, because without that, we don't really need people anymore. We're just gonna have machines that are, that are asking the questions and taking down the answers until we can connect with people and unleash greater uh, collaboration and communication we're going to have a limit on what we can accomplish. So I think it's human to human skills and business acumen. That's the, the next frontier for a lot of sellers. You, David, when you, when you said that last piece about human to human, what popped into my mind was Tom Brady, because I'm thinking about what I thought about when I was watching that game um, was this quote from Napoleon Hill. And, and he's the author of Think and Grow Rich. And he said a long time ago, uh, he said it about men, but the quote certainly applies to men and women. He said, most men never achieve greatness until they're 40 years old. <laughs> First of all, to, to I all don't know if that's always men. true, but the, in certain fields, it certainly is true. And, uh, and I do believe that the, the peak uh, age is rising as people are uh, becoming more, so say, intellectually engaged that uh, they're not going through the same uh, decay, if you will, intellectually, that they might have gone through in earlier times. Well, well, that's that's true. And the point that I took away from it was, hey, to everybody under 40, don't put so much pressure on yourself that you're supposed to know everything because it does take time to develop this, this wisdom. That's number one. But then if you go back to the Tom Brady and, and you use the, the kind of quarterback comparison there, that no matter how talented you are at 24 years old, there's judgment decisions that need to be made that are very hard to learn by the time you're 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the takeaway here is using the analyst call you just described, using video, there's a way to develop wisdom from people who've done it before you. But you have to be inherently, uh, A, curious, and B, you have to be willing to ask for help. If you ask for help, whether it's from the internet, from people, like the help is there to make you a person of business acumen who can display that, that business acumen. And um, quite frankly, those are the people who become masters in the realm of selling versus that the, kind of the middle 60% that just gets by. Yeah, I think it's really a, a mindset. It's, uh, I always say you're only as good as your best habits. So do you have a habit of being curious about the business that you're selling to? Do you have a daily behavior that aligns with those habits and supports them? Um, at the end of the day, a lot of these ideas are really powerful, but they don't uh, truly realize their potential until they become habits. And uh, I think that's a, a big idea for a modern professional is how do I build just like in, in sports conditioning and training? What are the daily habits that build me up, build my colleagues up to become the best versions of themselves? And, and that's what sports teaches us. And that's what the, the prolonged athletic careers of, of athletes is showing us is that the frontier is still out there. It's, we're not even close to tapping the maximum if we uh, reframe how we think about performance and, uh, and how we prepare ourselves to perform.
Well, that's a, that's a great thought to end on. David, if people want to learn more about you, about Sparks IQ, about some of the, the different programs you have, ranging from negotiation to personality <laughs> profiling to, to sales, uh, what's the best way for them to do this? Uh, easiest way is just go on sparksiq.com. There's a full uh, array of content that can help you to understand how we help to elevate sales and profitability, accelerate that. You can also find me personally, David Bowders, on LinkedIn, and I'm always happy to connecting with new people. And we've got uh, quite a bit of content that we put out on LinkedIn as well. Great, David. We really appreciate. Uh, I appreciate this time, and we appreciate the work that we've done with you and your team to help share some of this message with our client base. Yeah, glad to be here today, Mark, and uh, we treasure the, the relationship with the Lego as well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Adapters Advantage, available on all major podcast platforms. Make sure you visit our website, alego.com, where you can subscribe to our podcast so you'll never miss an episode. If you liked this show, you might want to check out our virtual training kit to learn how to keep a remote team running at full speed. Go to alego.com slash virtual to download your kit today. Be sure to tune in for our next episode. And don't forget... One new idea can change your life.